It's December, and this is the video that I look forward to every year because I get to share everything in a positive way. Let's take a look at the best albums of 2018. If you're looking for the counterpart to this video, click on the YouTube card or the link in the description for my top 5 worst albums of 2018. For all you viewers who just want to know what I thought sucked. As always, I have not heard every album that came out in 2018. Duh. So, if I didn't talk about your favorite album on this list, leave a comment and let everyone know what you thought was the best. Besides that, you already know how top 10s work. Let's take a look. Number 10. If you would have told me over a year ago that Judas Priest would not only make a big return with a full tour, but also have one of the best metal albums of the year, then I would have thought you were insane. But in March of 2018, Firepower was released on us, and I think I can speak for many metal fans that this album really slapped us in the face for forgetting about what Rob Halford and company are capable of. This is the perfect example of an album that knows how to grab your attention right from the beginning. The first 10 or so minutes alone with the title track, Lightning Strike, and Evil Never Dies proves that there's still creativity burning, and the rolling percussion and rhythms are just as heavy as ever. The guitar work from Glenn Tipton is stellar, and if you think Halford still can't hang in 2018, then this album is the perfect response to that incorrect idea. Judas Priest is going on a big tour throughout the first half of 2019, including festival performances, and songs from Firepower definitely will be welcome at that live show. 2018 had a lot of mediocrity come from rock and metal bands, especially some of the bigger names, but Judas Priest proved they still know how to kick the door down. I am determined to see these guys live next year too, so if you haven't given Firepower a chance, it's really worth it. Check it out. Number 9. After Matt Skiba joined up with Blink-182 and really brought Blink back into the light, I didn't know if we'd ever hear anything from Alkaline Trio for many more years. I was fortunately wrong in that assumption. Is This Thing Cursed was a breath of fresh air and a lively, invigorating album that made me remember how much fun music can be. While some of the topics in the songs on the album like Demon and Division and the title track might have some bleak meanings, the music and vibe behind it all is infectious and it's really great to hear this band again. In a world of very watered-down pop punk, Alkaline Trio brought back a spark in the punk scene that I really hope inspires other bands to try a little bit harder. Mike and Dan are back in sync and it all comes in great. There was a five year gap between albums but when we finally got something new, Alkaline Trio made sure it was something that captured the feeling of the old albums. Alkaline Trio is when you write about personal topics and convey a serious message but you have great music to go along with it. The opposite is Simple Plan and every other whiny pop punk band ever. Number 8. I discovered Love Bites a few months ago and loved it instantly. These ladies from Japan are one of the best bands to come from the land of the rising sun in many years, or at least that I've heard. Their second album, Clockwork Immortality, just came out in December, and I rank it on the top 10 best albums of 2018 because it really is that strong. People in Europe, the UK, and all over Japan have figured out Love Bites has something special. The US needs to follow suit. The opening song hooked me, and the energy in Empty Daydream instantly connects. Love Bites did more than just power metal though, when they added strings and went for the gorgeous melody in the 7 minute epilogue. These ladies, Love Bites have all the elements required to make it big. In a metal world where people think of baby metal when they hear Japan and metal together, they need to be introduced to Love Bites. This is the type of band that can help change opinions and make a unique juggernaut in metal if they get the right attention. I may not have enjoyed Clockwork Immortality as much as I loved Awakening from Abyss, but I still really love this album. It proves that this band has so much potential. The singing, the guitar, the drums, the rhythm, the speed, everything involved. For the love of God, give these ladies a chance. Also, for the love of God, Love Bites, come to the United States! Number 7.
Ordinary Corrupt Human Love is this year's album that I may never be able to fully explain to someone on how it sounds or have another band to compare it to. Black metal by definition is a hard sell to any music fan. For every second of serenity in the music, you are then shocked with the shriek and scream of George Clark who could wake the dead with his voice. It was after the unlikely success of the song Honeycomb that I think many people started to realize the talent of this band and this album's guitar and drum work mixed with the over-the-top screaming all equates to this indescribable hour of music. You get surprises like a Night People with an appearance from Chelsea Wolf, and hearing songs that are over 10 minutes long but fly by is something extremely difficult to do. Deaf Heaven makes seamless tracks this way, and it all flows perfectly. Ordinary Corrupt Human Love is a mouthful, but it's worth trying to say and then figure out. Deaf Heaven is another band that whenever someone asks me about them, who they are, why I like them, what they sound like, my response is... Uh... Still love them though. Number six. Talk about a band that battled uphill in order to release an album both in the physical work sense and what they had to go through personally. In losing a band member and brother, Architects took their time to rebuild and through that came a loud, dynamic, and expertly mixed metalcore album in Holy Hell. The hype started over a year ago when Doomsday was released, being the last track that Tom Searle contributed to. This song is a monster, and there are many others in Holy Hell that prove that there is diversity in their style. Royal Beggar shows off more singing capability from Sam Carter, and Mortal After All demonstrates his screaming, all with some fantastic percussion throughout the entire album runtime. Much like Deaf Heaven, Architects is not for everyone. I would definitely recommend everyone listen to Doomsday, though. At the very least, that is a song that just about any rock or metal fan can approve of. This album has so much more than Doomsday, though, and Architects really made something strong. I can't even imagine how difficult it must have been to write this album after losing Tom, but they really shined here. Metalcore still has a band that isn't trying to chase a trend. They're just doing their own thing and they're succeeding at it. Architects has something special with Holy Hell. Also, I tried to really limit my jokes about Architects like, oh, they have the blueprint for a good album here. I'm bad with the dad jokes. Number five. After many years and questions of whether Tool or Perfect Circle would come back, or if Mater would stop playing in his vineyard, we finally got Billy Howard L to reign in the Madman and deliver one excellent album in Eat the Elephants. Is it stronger than 13th Step for Merida Gnome? No, and it doesn't have to be. The music here is memorable, and Maynard and Billy have not lost a step. Some of the tracks that I didn't love originally on this album, like The Contrarian, I now can't get enough of. The banner anthems of The Doomed and Talk Talk are as strong as they were when released. This is the perfect example of an album that requires many listens through to really get it. It may not be a front-to-back masterpiece, with the final track leaving some fans, including myself, a bit confused with why that needed to be there, but with so much good, whether it be in Solemn Disillusion, the fun yet morbid So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, or the re-recording of Buying Down the River, Eat the Elephant deserves the praise that it received this year. Year. I openly admit my bias for A Perfect Circle because they are one of my all-time favorite bands. However, I honestly think any rock fan can find something to enjoy on Eat the Elephant. Billy Howardell has proven he can master any instrument he touches, and Maynard, once again, even in his 50s, has proven he can still sing about anything and make it work. That being said, feel free to leave a comment asking when's the next Tool album. Number four. In a year where many rock and metal bands were chasing electronic fads and going beep boop, High on Fire brought the roar. Matt Pike and Company's latest offering held nothing back. And what's better is that this was a tribute to the metal godfather Lemmy. Electric Messiah is exactly the type of album that Mr. Kilmister would be proud of, as this thing is ferocious and unrelenting from beginning to end. Hearing songs like the title track and Freebooter give you that heavy bass and drum pound that goes straight to your bones. So many years into High on Fire's career and they still prove how they are an underrated name in metal. This album is a step up from 2015's Luminiferous and Pike's growl will be your subconscious angry voice after 
after hearing Electric Messiah. For a three-piece band to produce this much volume is impressive, but for them to make something this carnal and loud is amazing. If you're looking for something really heavy, High on Fire has exactly what you need. Electric Messiah offers that in spades. Lemmy would be proud. Or Lemmy would just give the finger and have a big smile on his face. I'm pretty sure that's what he did when he was proud of people. He just flipped them off with a big smile, too. Number three. Of all the returns to music over the past decade, Under Oaths might be the most unexpected and subsequently successful. This is an example of a band maturing over the years while away from each other, getting back together on the right terms, and then creating something exceptional. Erase Me from beginning to end is an album that I think took many listeners, including old fans, by surprise. It's a bit of a difference of the Under Oath from the previous decade, but I feel that this time has helped mellow these Floridians and narrow their focus into something sonic and tightly produced. The volume is never overwhelming and it has the right changes and speed at all the perfect times. I will never stop singing the praises of albums you can play from beginning to end in one shot, and Erase Me definitely fits this bill. The opening of It Has to Start Somewhere leading into Rapture is great. The underrated gem of Bloodlust and that fantastic fantastic closer I gave up leaves many memorable moments worth going back to. My explaining it all does not do this album justice. Give this one a chance if you are on the fence. Even though Under Oath has been reformed for two years now, it still feels weird to think of them as reformed and excelling at everything. I could not be happier for this band, and I want their continued tour in 2019 to have more attention drawn towards Erase Me. I love the fact that a band can work through their issues, get back together, make great music, and excel with it, and succeed, and people like it. We need more of that in rock and metal. Number two. Miles Kennedy does not get enough credit. Whether it's Alter Bridge or working with Slash, the man is almost never talked about as a key voice or frontman in rock, or even as a powerhouse guitarist. He's a big part of the scene since Alter Bridge's debut in 2004. All that aside, Year of the Tiger marks the true solo act I knew Kennedy was capable of, but I was not expecting the direction he took. It's not a long guitar solo album with Miles singing his head off. This is mostly acoustic blues folk rock style, with multiple instruments being used with an acoustic guitar, banjo, and even a mandolin. It might be hard to imagine a man shredding on a banjo, but it happens here. Everything works on this solo album. Miles Kennedy has proven he can take anything in rock and surpass all expectations. Don't get me wrong, there is some electric work here with the stellar song The Great Beyond, but what shines are the southern rock vibes from the title track and Mother. This album is not a light romp either as it sings about the death of Miles' father many years ago. Year of the Tiger is something different in a year of electronic pop rock and all the beep boops. It's sonic, it's cohesive, it's well written, masterfully executed, and Miles has proven again why he deserves so much more respect than he's been given throughout the years. If you are looking for something new and outside the riff solo chug along fest that rock can be, Give this one a listen as soon as you can. Number one. Many of you watching this far and seeing my number one choice will think Prickel is just a topical and easy pick. Some of you can't stand Ghost because you don't think it's heavy enough. Well, for starters, I never heard Tobias come out and say that Ghost is the most ferocious metal band playing right now. In fact, he's gone on interviews saying that he writes songs with the intent of being both creative and catchy. Put aside your own notion of whether you think Ghost is metal or not. The album is still not only great, it's unique. There are so many good features on here and so much to take in. Sorry that not every metal album can be 20 minute guitar solos, double bass drums pounding constantly, and a man screeching into a microphone for 10 minutes straight until his vocal cords audibly pop. What I love about this album is a laundry list of features including the over-encompassing theme of death, the flow of rhythms and rock to slow dirges and crooning from Cardinal Copia, and that it features music where the ghouls have time to shine, an example being the amazing Miasma. 
there are many instruments and styles all contributing, and it cannot be stressed enough that Cardinal Copia sounds smooth here. Whether it's the rock style in Rats and Faith, the 70s-inspired dance macabre, or the anti-hymns of Pro Memoria and Life Eternal, there is a lot to take in, all in 42 minutes across 10 tracks, so it's not even that long of an album. People may not love the gimmick, they may not love the dark messages, some of you might even think Ghost is full-on Satanist. I can't stress this enough. This is Halloween levels of Satanism. There are episodes of The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror that are more Satanist than this band. There is so much good in Prickell, masterfully mixed in level, everything comes in clear, it flows from beginning to end, and it's fun. This is an example of a fun album to listen to. It's music that makes you glad to hear it. That is what rock and metal need more of. Everyone has an opinion on Ghost now. It's undeniable. It's important to listen to their music before you say one way or another, though. I recommend you give Prickell a chance, because I think this is the best album of 2018. And that was a look at what I feel are the top 10 best albums of 2018. Leave a comment, let everyone know what you thought the best album of this year was. Huge thanks to my patrons over the past 12 months who have made this channel possible. You can get perks and have a say in what I review by supporting Rocks on Patreon. For more info, click on the link in the YouTube card or in the description below. Please subscribe, it helps a ton to get noticed in the YouTube algorithm, and you'll get notified when I put out more album reviews and special videos. You can check out my concert photography on Instagram, and you can keep up to date with Rocks on Facebook and Twitter.